Hello, Rocky Mountain Conference. Uh, welcome to annual celebration 2020 in a whole different way. Um, of course, we've all been challenged this year by the virus and by the racism that we see in our country. And of course, because of that pandemic, particularly the pandemic of the coronavirus, we're not meeting in person, we're meeting virtually. But you know, as the staff and I have worked on this over the last few months, we've realized there are a lot of values that we get out of this virtual meeting that we may not out of a in-person meeting, one of which is we're going to deliver for you a fabulous keynote by Dr. Susan Thistlethwaite, who is the Professor Emeritus and President Emeritus of Chicago Theological Seminary, one of the UCC's uh, star progressive forward-facing seminaries. And Susan and her husband live right here in Colorado now that she's retired. In fact, she has turned her, um, her life now toward writing novels, which actually um, use theological themes to express what's happening in America today. And so we're just delighted to have Susan with us. She's going to talk to us about this intersection between the pandemic of coronavirus that we call COVID and the pandemic of racism. And there's gonna be a lot, this is, you're getting a banquet of opportunities here. So please take it in and um, we'll have opportunity to talk about it in various ways. As you know, our theme is leading in troubled times, and Susan does not shy away from the reality of the trouble in which we live. There are so many things, if we open our eyes, that trouble us and that can break our hearts, break us open, often to moments of despair. And part of leading in this moment is choosing to see, choosing to see the trouble, choosing to um, let our hearts be moved and broken open by what we see. And as you said, uh, you know, these, there's two pandemics really that are happening in our world, multiple pandemics, we could say. Um, I'd say the two that Susan really brings into focus here uh, is the new pandemic of a, of a virus that we still know so little about that is affecting all of us all across the globe and is affecting people of color and people in parts of our world that have less resource, more, that's part of it. But there's also this pandemic that has been going on since the founding of our country, yes. uh, the systemic racism and white supremacy that has been happening for generations that many are just now waking up to the real, the realness of that and the effect of that and the suffering that has been happening for so long uh, and suffering in different ways, suffering um, that is hurting all of us, really. And so she brings both of those into view, as well as other realities that also connect to those two pandemics, from climate change to, um, to just how we, um, how we understand the response of church in this time. In face of all of this trouble, what is a church to do? How are we to respond? What is, what is our future as we look at and willing to look at the trouble that exists in, uh, in our nation? So, um, there is a lot. This is a dense presentation. It's something that I am so grateful we'll be able to go back to again and again and again. And so as you view this today, our invitation um, is to come at it from a place of an open heart, to come at it from a place of curiosity. So there's things that you may agree with. There's things that you may adamantly disagree with. There may be things that you had never even considered or thought of before. And the invitation is simply not to pay attention so much as what do I agree with or you know, what do I don't agree with, but huh, curiosity. Where am I being touched by this? Where am I being invited to lean in? Where am I invited to just pay attention to how I, how I feel? What am I, what's showing up for me in my heart, in my mind, in my body as I watch this? And to just take a piece. You don't need to take in the whole thing. You might notice one thing and let that be the thing that you focus on for a bit. Um, so this is just an invitation for us to enter into more conversation in this time. And I'm so grateful to Susan for the depth that she's bringing. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching this as a watch party, we'll have time to talk afterwards. If you're watching this on your own, we hope that you will go to the Rocky Mountain Conference website and see where there is some opportunities for question and answer, specifically on our 
our first Saturday, July 25th, we'll have a question and answer with Susan Thistlethwaite at 11 a.m. on Saturday. Thank you all for being a part of the Rocky Mountain Conference and for bringing yourselves to this moment. Bless you all. Enjoy the show. I'm Susan Brooks Thistlethwaite, President Emerita and Professor Emerita of Chicago Theological Seminary. And I'm going to share with you this talk, keynote, uh, for your Rocky Mountain Conference. Now, when Sue Art first asked me to do this, we were talking about, you know, talk something about the future. And the image that came to my mind was Jonah and the whale, sitting around there in the belly of the whale and saying to myself, it's so dark in here, I can't see anything. It's a big, big gray whale. And from this perspective, it seems ridiculous to say what's next. We're in here, we're in this, we're in this dark. How can we see anything? And I pondered that for a while. And so, suppose in 2019, I showed you this photo and I predicted that in 2020, Senator Mitt Romney would march in a Black Lives Matter demonstration wearing a mask and chanting Black Lives Matter. And in 2019, you might have said, Susan is losing it. Okay, so predicting the future is not going to happen. However, it does seem to me there are things we are learning now. Now, I wrote this book, Women's Bodies as Battlefield. It is basically the summary of all the work that I have done in my life on violence against women and against war. And I'm not going to inflict a lot of theory on you. Really, I'm not. But um, I did invent this theory of critical physicality. And what I mean by that is think with the body. And I'm going to carry that through our time together here. All right. Now, look, the virus is winning. OK, let's just get that a political strategy of ignore the virus and it will go away has been disastrous. We're going to have to learn to live with this virus for a very long time. Vaccines are still in my family or doctors, medical scientists, I polled the group and in fact, vaccines a long way away. Hope for this is not a strategy. And the length, the immunity you may get from this would be short, short. There are surely more of this kind of virus on the way. And I just imagine you saw the pictures of those pigs in China. Is there another H1N1 virus on the way? Who knows? But, COVID-19 theology is love of mask and neighbor. Masks, social distancing, generally protect others. This is a theology we can get behind, are behind. But politicizing mask wearing is a way to further social polarization. It's astonishing. The rest of the world looks at us like we're stark raving mad. But this is what's happening. So political polarization is a body theology problem. It's either them or me. Life, death. And we have seen there are some bodies that there are some saying do not deserve to live. The pound I can't breathe is that kind of, you don't deserve to live, versus God breathed into them the breath of life, Genesis 2.7. The 
The reason we say Black Lives Matter is because they don't. Let all the older people die to save money on Social Security. Now, I'm not going to die for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. In my life, Wall Street, it's clear to me my body matters more than that. But I want to point out that this is a life or death. This is a death cult we've got going on here. Transgender people are a direct body challenge to this either or way of thinking and acting. White, black, rich, poor. Transgender bodies subvert that. And that is why I think this time is also seeing such attacks on transgender people. I mean, political attacks in terms of denying health care protections put in place by the Obama administration Therefore, you deserve to die. Betsy DeVos, God help us. Federal funding will be denied to schools that let transgender athletes compete in sports and their preferred gender. And there is the epidemic of murders of transgender people, which are often extremely horrific murders. So here's my number one, think with the body, theological shift. Pandemics show it is a disastrous mistake to pretend like the body does not exist. And no matter what Plato thought, and I go after Plato in my Women's Bodies of Battlefield book quite extensively, bodies are different and those differences are sacred. There is no body that doesn't deserve to live. That is denial of God's work in creation. I believe it's heresy. You know, when this administration first started, I thought there would be a lot of problems and I would have a different point of view. But I never thought that the worst problem would be heresy. I never thought that. But I think so much flows from that. And social injustice, my last point in this topic, manifests itself in the body, how bodies are treated. All right, second part. How much do we need these walls? Respecting the body in our churches has meant online worship, social distancing, we respect the body, but we affirm the body. So there's a conflict between our affirmation of the body and human beings need physical touch versus the dangers of transmission. This is just, this is with us. This is here. I uh, wrote as a columnist for the Washington Post on faith section for almost a decade. And they would sometimes give us assignments. And when Pew came out with their uh, study about the spiritual but not religious, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, they asked us to write on that. So I wrote a column that was very popular. Uh, that I titled, Spiritual But Not Religious, question mark, okay, but you'll be hungry in an hour. And what I said is that there is a need for sustaining institutions. Spirituality is the sweetness of faith, but you've got to have some carbs or you're not going to make it through the day. And our institutions are the carbs. We need institutions to connect us, not just spirituality, as important as that is. So think with the body, theological shift number two. We're going to have to live with this conflict between the need for high touch and the imperative to wear masks and socially distance ourselves for a fairly long time. The new shape of our institutional church in this time I think is the connective tissue for a future of continued physical distancing. Our need to engage the world for social justice in light of these realities is an imperative, I believe. Here's a chart that I think uh, 
pretty much sums up <laughs> uh, one of the greatest problems of our nation. I called it the white privilege chart. Now you'll see from the time, from the time of the civil rights movement, flat, right? Basically black wealth flat. And the white wealth goes up and up and up and up. A little glitch there in 20, 2008, but by and large going up. The mental, the physical, economic health of those at the bottom is starkly revealed. And this is, it hasn't changed. It has not changed for black households. What about progress? Mm -mm. No, no progress. Now the murder of George Floyd by the police has sparked, as you very well know, global demonstrations and an explosion of calls for change. Amazing amount of change. It of course didn't just happen. It represents years of work by Black Lives Matter activists and other organizations. In Colorado, the liturgical expression of kneeling happened at demonstrations in Colorado and around the nation. So what can we glean from this? Uh, could movement chaplain, let's just say that we need to keep this kind of activism going in different ways, perhaps, could movement chaplain become a more widespread ministry? Now look, we're looking at shifting the budgets of the police to a more public safety approach rather than everything's a crime. I wrote on this for the Vale Daily. Some of you may know, I am columnist now for the Vale Daily. At the, you know, the old saw, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So if all you've got is criminality as your paradigm for social unrest, then everything, homelessness, is going to look like a crime. The need for public safety chaplains, for example. Social work and counseling must be expanded. I've got two websites for you to visit here. Faith Matters Network out of Nashville does use chaplain specific language and these are programs to teach people to be movement chaplains. And the Trauma Response and Crisis Care team also there track for movements not specifically chaplain language, but it was started by our own CTS colleague, Zach Moon, uh, with Teresa Mateus, uh, and a broader network of spiritually informed care providers. Mental health, for example, which theoretically, if we're able to get this shift in police budgets, will expand chaplains, religious leaders, and so forth focusing on trauma, and I'm going to come back to trauma. Ministries we need, but we can't have even see, go back to the belly of the whale. In the 21st century, religious identities are changing. What seems to me addressing the moral and theological and spiritual needs of movement participants may not only happen in and through congregations. There's an increasing need to meet people where they are, in the streets, the planning meetings. I was just at a Zoom uh, city council meeting here in the Vale Valley. Boy, did they need some spiritual help. Uh, and in the newly envisioned spaces that don't even yet exist. Trauma. Trauma. Can you not say that this time has been traumatic? And it's just not going to disappear. People hold trauma in their bodies and in their minds. It can contribute to chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, anxiety, depression, hyperawareness, hypersensitivity. How traumatic the pandemic of COVID-19 has been. 
and the centuries-long pandemics, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and other oppressive structures. They are traumatic and people get traumatized and they hold it in the body. Thinking with the body, it seems to me, requires we reorient our ministries, both within and without the church, in light of this pandemic of trauma. So think with the body, number three, racism will not go away because of these current Herculean efforts to expose it. Good things happen, but there's a lot of backlash possible too, it's inevitable backlash. We will have to plan for the dismantling of the structures that work to keep systemic change from happening. You gotta, you know, like, like I said about the carbs, you gotta stay with the systemic dismantling. We will need to devote specific clergy and lay ministries trained to work on these issues full time. I think we've got to raise money for that, support those ministries. Look at that. Look at LA before the shutdown and after the shutdown. Okay, 17% the carbon emissions plunged during social isolation. There is no question carbon any longer, you know, people would question this, the major driver of climate change. Going back to normal is going to destroy the planet. We can't do that. We have to excise that language. The intersections of oppression and climate catastrophe are great. So all that I have mentioned, white supremacy, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, ableism, ageism, intersect to support the idea there are some disposable people and there are parts of the planet that are disposable. Corporate types use the language of sacrifice zones. There's just some things we're just going to have to accept, like old people dying or kids in school, maybe they'll die, but you know, there's a lot of them. Cancer Alley, Louisiana, uranium mining in the Navajo Nation. What about the Amazon? Is the Amazon now a sacrifice zone? I think it is. And the wealthy are already living in a climate apartheid. And they're planning for that future. They're planning for it. So we need to green our church future. We don't have any walls anyway. So we can see our way more clearly toward less of an ecclesial carbon footprint. This meeting being a case in point. But greening the future of the church has got to be more than what we call greenwashing. Yes, you know, changing the light bulbs in the church is not unimportant, but you've got to try to focus on the deep structures of climate apartheid. There is a body theology of the earth. So I am arguing the ultimate sin we are up against here is contempt for life itself. Some bodies do not deserve to live. And that includes the physical basis of life in the earth as a body. So think with the body, number four, and this is it. Um, we've gained an enormous amount of clarity about the changes that will be needed to prevent irreversible climate catastrophe. Getting back to normal will accelerate that catastrophe. Now the Green New Deal begins to get at some of these structural issues, but it's gonna be a very heavy lift. You, we've already gleaned clarity on the pushback on masks, right? Freedom to not wear a mask. Freedom to have whatever carbon footprint I want. So we gotta shift our priority to body-centered churches. Vulnerable bodies to disease, to oppression, are our constant priority, and we have to help each other see that. The structures that render bodies vulnerable are the focus of our activism. We have to have the courage to look at the places we may hold certain bodies in contempt, and this may include 
your own body. Something that after decades of work on domestic violence, I can tell you for sure that a lot of people hold their own bodies in contempt. And we have to work on that. And we have to make a change. Why do we do this? For the love of God and neighbor and the spectacular beauty of all that God has created. Now I've got some suggested discussion questions for you here. How does it make you feel to realize, if you did not already do so, that COVID-19 will not be conquered like polio? We're not going to get past it completely. And it will be with us, hopefully in a much diminished way, but it's not going away. What has been your experience of this shutdown period? Your family, work, your play, your church. How did that feel? How does it feel? Do you think the framing of the lecture is think with the body was helpful? Why? Why not? Contempt for certain bodies goes so far as to deny them the right to be alive. Do you think it's helpful, useful to understand this is contempt for God, as creator? Do you think it's heresy? New ministries and roles for churches are emerging in this time. Some of them are already here, some we're going to have to invent. Which ones do you? identify with. Thank you for listening.